Hey guys, if you've got kids, you can head on over to the Kids Church page on the St Andrews website. We've got some cool worship songs today, a video to watch, and today's activity is a true or false game. Acts 5 verses 1 to 11. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, How could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you want evidence that Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, was a serious historian, then you need look no further than his account of what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. God striking down members of the congregation is not the kind of thing that you want to shout from the rooftops. It's not the kind of thing that you want to advertise because it raises some very difficult questions. But Luke included it because he wanted to give as full an account as possible of the goings on of the early church. And to be honest, it's not necessarily the thing that pastors really want to preach on. Uh, if you go online, you'll find uh, a conspicuous lack of sermons on this subject. Uh, but I felt I had to include this passage in our series on the book of Acts uh, because I expect you to read your Bibles. Uh, don't just listen to what other people tell you about what's written in the Bible. Read it for yourselves. Take 10 minutes out of each day to study the Bible. Your eternity depends on the message of this book. Might just be a good idea to read it for yourselves. So I would expect people to be reading the Bible. And uh, I hope at the moment you're working your way through the book of Acts because that's what we're focusing on as a church. And if you're doing that, then there's no point me skirting around this difficult bit because you're going to come across it. And if there's one thing in the book of Acts that needs explaining, it's this, this story of Ananias and Sapphira. So firstly, what happened? Well, a few weeks ago, we were looking at the fellowship of believers from uh, Acts chapter 2, how they were selling property and valuables to ensure that nobody went without. And this comes up again in chapter 4, uh, reading from verse 33. It says this. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. So this was a fairly common thing that was happening in the church. And Ananias and Sapphira, a married couple, decided to sell some land. But instead of giving the full amount that they made from the sale of this land to the church, they decided to keep some back for themselves. And actually, there was nothing wrong with that. 
No one was under any compulsion to sell their property. And once sold, they certainly weren't under any compulsion to give all of the proceeds to the church. Ananias and Sapphira didn't have to sell their property and they didn't have to give uh, the, the, the sum total to the church. What they did wrong is that they told the church that they were giving the full amount and they may have even entered into a agreement, a contract or a covenant to that effect. But then they decided to keep some of that money back. So basically they were lying and we'll come to their motives in a bit. So there's this awkward moment. They're having some kind of church gathering and Ananias comes forwards and he lays the money from the sale of his land at the apostles' feet, or at least some of the money. And it's a substantial amount. Uh, uh, but Peter, presumably, uh, he's been given the gift of discernment or a word of knowledge. And he looks at Ananias and he says this. Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? In other words, you know, you didn't have to sell this land. You didn't have to give us the money. It, it was yours to do what you wanted with. And then he goes on. What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not just lied to human beings, but to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down dead. He carked it. Uh, this is quite a dramatic thing to happen during a church gathering. Uh, but it gets worse. Three hours later, Sapphira shows up and she has no idea what's happened. Now, if this happened at St Andrews or I think any other church, we would take Sapphira off to one side, somewhere quiet, and we'd say, Sapphira, sit down. We've got something we need to tell you. We've got some bad news. And we would break it to her that way. But Peter doesn't do that. Instead, he says, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? And actually, he's given... Sapphira the chance to come clean, the chance to repent, but she doesn't. She says, yes, that is the price. And Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. This is not easy, is it? Uh, a lot of people struggle with this, and I can understand why. Uh, there are people who refuse to believe that God would pass judgment in this way. Uh, it's even been suggested that Ananias and Sapphira both suffered from heart attacks, but that doesn't really fit with Luke's account. Luke clearly intends us to understand this as an act of divine judgment. So why did this happen? And this is where people often go astray with their inquiry. Uh, time and time again, people ask, were Ananias and Sapphira truly saved? Were they really Christians? Uh, and I don't think this is the, the thing to focus on, but because it comes up so often, I just want to address it very briefly. If Ananias and Sapphira had truly given their lives to Jesus, I don't think they could have faced this kind of, of immediate uh, judgment and condemnation. After all, uh, Romans 8 verse 1 says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I think we have to conclude that they were not in Christ Jesus. They were not true believers. So that begs the question, can someone be part of the church and not be saved? Well, only people who belong to Christ are part of the church and they are all saved. That is the true church. But then you also have the institutional church. That's everything that in the eyes of the world uh, somehow relates to Christianity. That, that is the institutional church. Not everyone that is somehow linked to the institutional church will be saved. Just because someone goes to church every week does not mean that they're on their way to heaven. Uh, someone could be a pastor or a priest and be on their way to hell. That's why Jesus told the parable of the wheat and the weeds. Both are allowed to grow up together, but they both meet with a very different end. It is possible for a person to think they are saved and not be saved. In Matthew 7, 21 to uh, 23, it says this. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I'm not reading this passage to scare people. The last thing I want is for followers of Jesus to doubt their salvation. But equally, I don't want people who are not saved to believe that they are, because that is a dreadful position to be in. And according to Jesus, it's a real possibility, and that may have been the case for Ananias and Sapphira. But the question of their salvation doesn't really help us to understand why this happened. God doesn't strike down every false believer concealed within the church, nor does he strike down those who are guilty of financial fraud or deception. In fact, there are only three people in the whole of the New Testament who are said to have been killed by God, and that is Ananias, Sapphira, and Herod Antipas, who was a, a, an evil despot. But it seems that God made an example of Ananias and Sapphira right at the beginning of the spirit-filled church as a perpetual warning against deception. This sin was incredibly serious because falsehood ruins fellowship. Falsehood uh, can bring down a church community. If the devil can't destroy the church by persecution, by force from without, he'll try to destroy the church by falsehood from within. And what we're reading about today is a strong warning about falsehood right at the beginning of the spirit-filled church. And actually, there's a precedent for this. Um, shortly after Israel entered the Promised Land, they, they fought against the city of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. We all know the story. Uh, and then they sent 3,000 warriors to fight against the city of Ai, uh, but they were defeated. It was a disaster. The Israelites couldn't understand it. After all, wasn't God supposed to be with them? Wasn't God supposed to be fighting for them? How could this happen? And as it turned out, God had allowed them to be defeated because when they conquered the city of Jericho, uh, someone had helped themselves to the plunder uh, which they were under obligation not to touch. In Joshua 11, sorry, Joshua 7 verse 11, God says this to his people. Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. So then they go through this long process to find out who it is who has done this. And they discover the culprit, a man called Achan, who is duly uh, stoned to death. And in verse 26, it says this. Over Achan, they heaped up a large pile of stones which remains to this day. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor, which means trouble ever since. In other words, let that be a lesson to you. If you lie to God's people, and if you lie to God, there'll be trouble. Things won't go well for you. So when Israel entered the Promised Land, and when the new Spirit-filled church starts to take off, God gives a foreboding warning against deception, because God knows that this kind of dishonesty, this kind of falsehood has the potential to do tremendous harm to his people. So what can we learn from all of this? Well, first, we need to think about Ananias and Sapphira's motive for their dishonesty and deception. And it basically boils down to hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is wearing a mask. It's pretending that we're something we're not. Ananias and Sapphira wanted the church to believe that they were more generous than they were. They wanted people to hold them in high esteem for a level of generosity that they weren't uh, willing to commit to. It's the kind of hypocrisy that Jesus uh, warned the Pharisees about uh, in Matthew 23 when he said this. Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. Jesus was direct 
And if you want to know just how direct, then read the whole of Matthew 23, which is where that quote comes from. So as Christians, we want to avoid all forms of hypocrisy. Not only do we not lie, but we do the opposite. We need to be transparent, open and honest. And that's why we need close friendships, relationships within the church. We can only really be honest about what's going on in our lives if we have people who we know and we trust. And all of us face struggles. Sometimes those struggles are the result of external factors, things that we can do absolutely nothing about. Sometimes our struggles are the result of our own sin, uh, the mess we make of things because of our sinful nature. And sometimes it's a combination of both. A transparent life is one where we have people that we can talk to and confide in about the difficult things. Too often we want to make our lives look good on the outside and so we gloss over our struggles. And if we're not honest about who we are, we can never change. And we need one another's help to change. Ananias and Sapphira should have found someone in the church they could talk to. They should have said, we're really struggling with our egos. Uh, being liked and respected is super important to us. In fact, we almost got to the point where we were willing to lie to convince people that we're more generous than we are. Will you pray for us? Once it's out in the open, it can be dealt with. Uh, the opposite of being a hypocrite is being sincere, genuine, transparent and having integrity. We are called to live a transparent life before God and one another. And who are we trying to deceive anyway? Others? Ourselves? God? A deceptive person, a hypocrite, will be able to deceive other people some of the time, but more often than not, they'll think they're deceiving people, when in reality, the people who they think they've taken in are actually not convinced at all, I can see straight through it. Uh, I once was staying in a hostel in Rio. And uh, when you stay in hostels, you meet all kinds of people from all over the world. And one evening there was a small group of us sat outside around a, a table chatting. And there was one particular man who was doing most of the talking. And not only was he incredibly self-promoting, but he was clearly lying. I can't even remember what he was talking about, but it was so obviously not true. And I'd recently left the Marines, so I wasn't really aware of that social convention which says that you've got to politely listen to uh, this kind of nonsense and, and, and not challenge it. And I'm not recommending uh, this approach, uh, but I said, why are you lying to us? Do you really expect us to believe all this nonsense? Well, that was a bit of a conversation killer. Uh, but I realised from this that so many people go unchallenged. And so they think people believe their lives, their lies, when uh, in reality, they don't. And normally they're making complete fools of themselves. They don't even realise it. Well, when Ananias lied in front of the church, Peter called him out straight away. And it was the right thing to do. Church discipline is important. Although the church often tends towards one of two extremes, either the church is completely draconian and there's a real absence of grace, or, and I think this is more often the case, uh, there's no kind of church discipline whatsoever, even in the case of very serious offences. Now, we'd be right to say that in Christ, there is always forgiveness, but forgiveness can only follow repentance. How can a person be forgiven if they have no remorse and every intention of continuing with their wayward behaviour? It is impossible to turn to Christ. It is impossible to receive Christ without there being repentance. But, you know, sometimes we can deceive even ourselves. We're masters of self-deception. We can trivialise, excuse and gloss over the sin in our lives. We can imagine that we're in the right even when we're blatantly in the wrong. And this is why it's so important to confront sin, to confront falsehood where it exists within the church. But there are ways to do it, and we want to do it in a way that is tactful and loving and pastoral. In fact, Jesus gave us a model for this. In uh, Matthew 18, Jesus says, 
if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, I think we should remember how Jesus treated pagans and tra tax collectors and sinners. He, he loved them. He reached out to them. He had great compassion for them. He wanted the best for them. But he recognised that they were sinners in need of salvation. And I think if someone gets to the point where they're prepared to effectively battle the whole church, then we need to recognise that they are people who need to be saved. They are people who have not given their lives to Christ. Now, admittedly, when it comes to Jesus's uh, model of how to deal with these things, Peter jumped straight to stage three. Uh, but that was because Ananias lied in a very public way. He was bringing his money and laying it at the apostles' feet in front of the church. Peter had to deal with it there and then. You know, there may be times when we manage to thoroughly deceive ourselves and others, but we cannot deceive God, not even for a second. God sees not just our actions, but our heart, our motivation and our conscience. If we try to deceive the church, if we're presenting ourselves as one thing, but really we're another, ultimately, we're not lying just to the church, but to God. And God will see straight through it every time. So there are two main things that we learn from this passage. Firstly, we want to be the opposite of deceptive. We want to be people of integrity. And that means identifying and challenging our own hypocrisy. Secondly, we understand that dishonesty and hypocrisy in the church should not go unchallenged because falsehood ruins fellowship. The story of Ananias and Sapphira is a perpetual reminder that attempting to deceive the church, attempting to deceive God, is a dangerous, harmful and foolish thing to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that we can be very honest with ourselves and with others and with you. Help us to recognise the sin and falsehood in our lives and help us to be willing to change. Help us to help one another to change for the better and be the kind of community that you want us to be. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, has promised to hear us when we ask in faith. Receive the prayers we offer. We pray for the many nations of the world, especially as we grapple with the COVID-19 pandemic. Guide with your wisdom and power the leaders of the nations so that everyone may live in peace and mutual trust, sharing with justice the resources of the earth. Give the people of this land a spirit of unselfishness, compassion and fairness in public and private life. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray for the worldwide church, especially as it strives to cope with fresh practical ways in which to worship and minister in the present health climate. Send out the light and truth of your gospel and bring people everywhere to know and love you. Enable those who minister among us to commend your truth by their example and teaching. We pray your special blessing and guidance on all who are involved in organizing arranging, recording, handling the digital processes for worship and group gatherings. We bring before you those who will be gathering for baptism of Ruby today, and we pray that it will be a memorial event, blessing all the family and friends. We, will pr we also pray especially for Reverend Charlie, Reverend Erica, our Bishop John, and Archbishop Philip and their families. May we gladly receive and obey your word. Father, hear our prayer, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray for those in need. We give thanks for the great numbers of essential workers, 
the many behind-the-scene workers, their families who cope with them and support them. We commend to your loving care, merciful God, all who are in sorrow, sickness, discouragement, or any other trouble. Give them patience and a firm trust in your goodness and provision. Help those who care for them and bring us all into the joy of your life-saving grace. We remember before you those who have died suddenly and unprepared. Hear us, Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.